Hello everybody and welcome to Sentinel, Arizona. Today I am west of Gila Bend along Interstate 8, out for a busy day of exploring and camping. The plan is to follow the Oatman Massacre Trail out across the scenic volcanic field to the 1851 ambush site of the infamous Oatman family. After exploring the history and the surrounding area, I'll continue on to the west. Things will get rockier and rougher along a spur trail, along tracks of the Butterfield stage route, and eventually make it to an old building and dam site along the Gila River. From there, I'll briefly retrace my path and spend the night camped out along the historic stagecoach route. In the morning, I'll continue to explore the numerous historic artifacts in the area before finally making it back to pavement. It should be a really great trip loaded with some early Arizona history and some really unique terrain. My journey today will begin here, about a mile north of Sentinel along Agua Caliente Road. As the paved road curves left, a dirt road splits off to the right and heads east. Before getting underway, I first had to get aired down. While the trail remains easy for most of its length, the last few miles would be over hard and sharp volcanic rock, which can be exceptionally brutal on tires. I took the tires down to around 15 psi. Within a few minutes, that was all done and I was ready to embark on the trail, which seemed a little bit wetter than usual today. A recent rain had blown through the area, and while the weather was quite nice today, it was definitely a bit windy. I set out east along Oatman Road. The road remained wide and smooth. After a little while, the road curved to the left and headed due north towards Oatman Mountain. The trail had a few more wet spots, but it was nothing major. The pace remained fairly quick, despite a few sections of rockier trail. As I moved north, I entered into the Sentinel Volcanic Field. The terrain here was noticeably different as piles of black basalt lava flows dominated the landscape. I continued up the trail as it twisted towards Oatman Mountain. Nine miles from the paved road, I arrived at a trail junction and split off to the left. Coming from the south, the BLM signpost here is blank, but it is marked 8232 on the other side. I was now headed for the Oatman Massacre site, located up ahead on the edge of the lava flow. For the rest of the day, I'd be on rougher trails. I headed northwest as things got progressively narrower. The trail meandered over the rough rocks, and I eventually came to another trail split. I stayed right to head for the massacre site, but later on in the day, I would be continuing on the other trail as it goes further west. The trail continued on and eventually turned to the right and joined a rocky path marked with rock carns. I was now following along the historic Butterfield Overland Route. While it was only a short section, it was neat to be driving on the same trail used by stagecoaches in the 1860s. It was certainly bumpy in the Jeep 
and I can only imagine the ride those old wagons would have experienced. The trail continued a short distance further north, and I soon arrived at the Oatman Massacre site at the end of the road. I hopped out to explore the area. The massacre site sits near the edge of the cliff, just above the agricultural valley of the Gila River. Today, a sign and rock pile marks where the attack took place. The wagon trail can be seen heading downhill to the east. The Oatmans, along with other families, set out from Independence, Missouri in August of 1850. The wagon train was a sect of Mormonism known as Brewsterites. Their goal was to head for California in order to find religious freedom. The party traveled west, splitting several times due to disagreements. Royce Oatman took charge of one of the bands and led the group as far as Maricopa Wells, which is about 60 miles east of this location. When they reached this oasis in the desert, the animals and people were all exhausted from the journey. The party opted to stay put knowing that the upcoming miles would be particularly barren and filled with hostile Native Americans. Royce, however, was determined to press on to their destination at the mouth of the Colorado River. The Oatmans, which consisted of Royce, his eight and a half month pregnant wife Mary Ann, and their seven children continued on alone as they pushed west. Four days after leaving Maricopa Wells, sometime in February or March of 1851, they arrived at this flat area of the Gila River, located below the cliffs. At this point in their journey, they were beyond exhausted. They slowly climbed up this rocky hill, pushing their animals to the limit. The family had to unload the wagon and hand carry supplies up the hill to save weight. By the end of the day, they finally reached the top of the hill and began to reload their supplies. Marianne prepared a simple bean soup and bread dinner for the family. Their goal was to push on through the night, avoiding the heat of the day. The family was then approached by a group of Native Americans who initially appeared friendly. They asked Royce for tobacco and he obliged. They then asked for cornmeal. Royce told them the family was short on supplies but reluctantly gave them some bread. The natives continued to ask for supplies and quickly grew impatient with Royce's stinginess. They soon turned violent and clubbed much of the family to death. Lorenzo, age 15, was beaten and left for dead near the edge of the bluff. The natives took Olive, age 14, and Marianne, age 7, as captives. The other six Oatmans were left dead where they fell. Somehow, against all odds, Lorenzo survived the attack and in the following days managed to get to help and heal. He and other members of a wagon train returned to the massacre site and buried his family underneath rock piles since the ground here was too tough. He was determined to get his sisters back. Originally thought to be Apache, the family had actually been attacked by western Yavapais who were over 50 miles south of their traditional tribal land. The two Oatman girls were treated rough in captivity with the Yavapais before eventually being traded to the Mojaves. With the Mojaves, the girls were welcomed into the tribe. Marianne died in captivity, but Olive lived with them for several years, even receiving traditional face tattoos. When Lorenzo was 19, he made it to Fort Yuma and eventually convinced the Mojaves to trade with him and release Olive. Olive's rare life experience became a popular story told all over the US. The modern town of Oatman is named for Olive, even though it sits over 150 miles away from the massacre site. Today, numerous crosses remain. While it says February 18th on the sign, the unclear record keeping of the area suggests that this could have actually occurred sometime in February or March of 1851. The Oatman family was eventually moved from the massacre site and laid to rest in the river valley below, marked by a gravesite which sits near a cluster of trees. I have actually visited the gravesite before, but access is questionable as many of the roads leading to it, as well as the farm down there, are under new ownership. Walking down the old wagon road, you can actually still see numerous places where the wooden wheels of all the wagons have marked up the surface. 
It's no surprise that such a brutal climb along this trail would leave a mark today, but it is still really neat to see over 150 years later. While the massacre is definitely the most notable event here, it is not the only piece of history that remains. This has been a high traffic area for hundreds of years. First used by early Native Americans following the Gila River, it was later used by pioneers and prospectors traveling west to California. By the mid-1840s, it became known as the Gila Trail, which is known today as the Southern Immigrant Trail. The route was used by names like the Mormon Battalion, the San Antonio and San Diego Mail Line, and later by the Oatmans. In 1858, John Butterfield used a similar route in his establishment of the Butterfield Overland Mail Service. Numerous initials remain carved into the rocks in the area, such as this one from 1851, signifying the numerous travelers that passed this direction. Just when I thought I had covered most of the history of the area, a side-by-side -side arrived at the massacre site. Two older gentlemen got out, and we began talking. We discussed the history of the area, and I soon found out I was chatting with local historian and author, Gerald Inert, who I've actually talked with via email before. It was great talking to Jerry, and he clued me into even more history on the area. It turns out, the hill I was exploring was not Butterfield's route, but in fact an earlier version of the trail. Butterfield's route sits about 50 feet south of the trail the Oatmans were traveling on, and it was better constructed. The road was wider, had slight curves to ease the grade, and while it followed the Gila Trail in most places, it was improved in many areas to allow for the more efficient delivery of mail and passengers. The Butterfield route was only used until the onset of the Civil War in early 1861, but his route and amenities would continue supporting migrants along the trail until the creation of the railroad in 1880. Across the river valley sat Four Cemetery, named for William Four. Four was a Butterfield employee at the Oatman Flat Stage Station, located just to the north, and he even created his own station and unsuccessful toll road in the following years. It was great talking with those guys about the extensive history of the area, and I ended up spending much longer than originally planned at the massacre site. You should definitely check out some of Jerry's books if you are interested in this kind of history. Nevertheless, it was now 3 p.m., and I wanted to get moving on to some of my other stops. From the massacre site, I headed back south on the rough trail. I crossed back over the Butterfield route, which is really well preserved in this area. Back at the trail split, I stayed to the right and continued west on New Trail. Things remained rocky as the BLM road crossed over another really well preserved section of historic Stagecoach Trail. If everything went as planned, this is the area I wanted to camp at tonight. Past this point, the trail meanders across the lava flow. Certain sections are nice and smooth while others remain washed out and incredibly rocky. After finding my way a little over a mile down the road, I soon arrived at my next stop. An abandoned structure sat here near the edge of the cliff. This building seemed to contain two different rooms and some kind of patio or covered area between the two. I walked around the structure and it appeared to remain in very good shape. The walls, which appear to be sourced from the local volcanic rock, were mostly still standing and even had a few old carvings of their own. The old windows still had a nice view as well. Some kind of concrete box remained in the middle. It was unclear what this would have been used for, but it's possible it was some kind of safe or storage area. The south room featured a large metal tank, which presumably was used to hold water. 
This area has no known mining claims and sits a little less than a mile north from the stage route. After some research online and finding a 1920s book about the lower Gila River, I eventually found a tidbit about this area. It appears that this area was used as part of an unsuccessful attempt to create irrigation canals, a head gate, and even a diversion dam to block the flow of the Gila River. It is here at this point that the Gila is pinched into a narrow point between the two rock walls. While this would have made sense for the location of a dam, the incredible power of the Gila during flood years would have quickly spoiled that plan. Approaching the edge of the bluff, you can still see concrete and rock structures that match the description. It is unclear what the large tank and other equipment would have been used for, but this is almost certainly some of the efforts that were made in around 1890 to 1900 to harness the water of the Gila. After spending some time exploring this hidden gem, it was time to get moving on to camp. I retraced my path back out, along the rough trail into a nice flat spot. All right, so we have made it to our intended campsite. So I just finished up the spur trail out to that old building where you could see the dam and some of the ruins left there. Backtracked just a little bit, not quite all the way to the open massacre site, but I'm actually at a point here where the BLM road actually crosses the Butterfield Overland route. So just right out my front windshield, I'm looking at the old stagecoach route. It's about 50 feet away, and uh, we'll be camping here for the night. So nice flat spot. Unfortunately, it is a little bit windier than I would have liked, but the problem is we're up on a volcanic plain and there are really no hills, so there's not really going to be a better spot anywhere nearby. In the meantime, it's been a really good day, kind of taking it slower, doing some exploring and looking at stagecoach stuff and the massacre site, and it was nice talking to those guys back there and learning a little bit more. But the plan from here is to get camp all set up. It's not gonna take me long, so after that I'll be relaxing for a little while. Still got a couple hours of daylight, and then we'll be on to dinner, which in honor of our day and being camped along the route will be an old school kind of simple meal. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But in the meantime though, it's time to relax and get camp set up. I popped open the tent and worked on getting things ready for the night. By 5 o'clock, I had the kitchen set up and ready to go, and all of my important stuff loaded up in the tent. The wind had luckily died down, at least for now. I sat down to relax and enjoy the view. The setting sun, mixed with the unique volcanic terrain, made for one heck of an experience. To the north sat Oatman Mountain and its towers up top. The lush green river valley below provided a stunning contrast to the dark rocks. And the historic stagecoach trail could easily be seen making its way across the landscape. This section remains really well preserved even after 150 years. The Sentinel Volcanic Field provided an otherworldly experience. There was no one around for miles, and I truly felt like I was on my own out here, joined only by the marks left by those that passed before me. By 6.30, the sun was just setting, and I fired up the stove to work on tonight's dinner. I wouldn't be doing anything fancy, quite the opposite really. In honor of those simple meals hastily scarfed down by the early pioneers, it would be beef stew tonight, and of course, beer.
Well, not too bad. Definitely not the best meal I've ever made while out camping, but certainly one of the more memorable. After dinner, it got dark quick. With no moon to speak of, the night sky was only illuminated by the faint glow of Phoenix far off in the distance. After a long day of exploring, it would be early to bed tonight. After a semi-restful night of sleep, I was up around 8 the following morning. While the temperature had been great and only dipped down to the mid-40s, the wind unfortunately had not let up. It picked back up during the night and continued gusting throughout the morning. Once getting up and around, I promptly got the tent packed up and put away. It's always nice getting that done first thing. It was then on to boiling some water for the usual breakfast and coffee. Once camp was broken down, I set out for one more walk down the historic stage road. It's interesting to imagine the people that traveled through the area and what they might have experienced. This was definitely one of the more unique campsites I've been to lately, and is one I'd like to return to someday. There's just so much to look at. After making it back to the Jeep, a side-by-side -side approached my camp. It was one of my new friends from yesterday, who was showing his wife around the area. We talked for a bit, and he mentioned that there were some petroglyphs nearby I should check out. He offered me a quick ride up the trail, and after a hike along some old footpaths, I soon came upon a decent sized wash. There was some standing water, but more importantly, numerous petroglyphs lined the rock walls. There were many different symbols carved along the banks. This spot was obviously of some kind of significance. The markings featured everything from Native American symbols to initials left by the 1849ers and other pioneers who passed this area. It is clear that this spot saw a lot of traffic. This completely unexpected find makes this area even better. Once making it back to the Jeep, it was nearly noon. I got rolling on the trail back out. The narrow trail soon gave way to graded roads. Since I have already covered the rest of the trail, which includes Painted Rock Petroglyph site on the north end of the trail, I figured I would head back out the way I came. I headed south on Oatman Road, as it meandered through the lava flow. The trail back was quick and easy. Less than an hour later, I found myself back at Agua Caliente Road. I aired up the tires real quick before jumping back on the paved road. I proceeded about a mile south back to I-8, but there was one more quick thing I wanted to check out before heading home. Just past the interstate and the railroad tracks sits numerous foundations. The main building appears to be the original Sentinel train depot, built in 1895. Numerous other structures remain scattered about. It makes for an interesting stop if you're passing through the area. After a busy couple days of exploring, I was soon back on the highway heading home. This trip had been really great. While I originally planned on seeing a lot of historic stuff at the massacre site and along the Butterfield Trail, there were certainly a few unexpected surprises thrown in as well. I was able to learn a lot and see a great piece of Arizona history. The terrain was stunning and camping out in the remote Sentinel Plain was really something. Thank you for tagging along on the adventure. I hope you were able to learn a little bit and maybe find some future trip ideas. And as always, we'll see you on the next one.